Back in 2016, the naked scientists interviewed a bulldog called Ronnie. <laughs> hello, hello. Ronnie was getting tested to see if he had a condition called brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome, or BOAS. Brachycephalic means flat-faced, and when dogs have flat faces, they have airways that get all squashed together. You just heard Ronnie snorting. Well, that's normal for a bulldog. But that's the sound that a dog makes when it can't quite breathe. BOAS isn't a disease you can catch. It's just a fact of certain dogs' biology. Which is weird because dogs used to be wolves, lethal hunters in the wilderness. How is it that today they can't breathe because their airways are literally too big to fit into their heads? Have they been betrayed by their own genes? For the past month, I've been on the case. Normally, we would have laws and rules. There isn't going to be one magic silver bullet. There is such a problem there. Bruce, Bruce, Biscuit. Welcome to The Dog Show. I'm Phil Sansom, and this is Naked Genetics. Imagine a dog, any dog. Do it now. What does it look like? Probably really different from the one I'm imagining. It might be as big as a Great Dane or as small as a Chihuahua and have fur that's brown, white, or even dark blue and anywhere from short hair to a massive, massive fluff ball. But will it sequence? We went to gene sequencing company Illumina to find out. Two of our younger correspondents are on the case, 12-year-old Amelia and 15-week-old Bruce. Hello, this is Ursula Arndt. I'm a scientist at Illumina. And what's your name? I'm Amelia and I own Bruce, the young puppy we've got here. Excellent. So Bruce, obviously an incredibly adorable black Labrador puppy. We're going to take DNA from the inside of its mouth. And what we have is a swap. So we're going to see if we can get him to keep it in his mouth and we're going to rub it around his cheek for a couple of minutes. What are you picking up from inside of the mouth with that swab? Mostly saliva, but what we should be getting is a lot of dog cells as well. And what we're hoping for actually, that we're not just getting dog, but we might be getting some of the bacteria that might be in his mouth as well. And what will you do with those? Sequence them on one of our sequences, and then we can tell you a lot more about Bruce. Bruce? Bruce? <gasps> nom nom nom. So right now I'm like trying to swap the inside of his cheek, and not just his teeth, without him eating the entire tube. And right now he's really trying to chew on my hand as well. Okay, I think we're good, Bruce. So I've now turned the swap around, and so the piece that looks like a Q-tip is now inside of the liquid. And that's gonna take the DNA from the swap and hopefully preserve it. Um, what happens next? So tomorrow morning we're gonna take this liquid that contains the cells, we're going to break up the cell and we're going to keep the DNA and throw away everything that's protein or that cell parts, cell walls and everything that's not DNA. We're going to sequence all of his genome and then we're going to, actually our biostaticians are going to look at how much wolf is in the dog. I think that's one of our main questions. Mm -hmm. Then we we'll see what else we can find. How big is a DNA code of a dog? I think it's essentially the same size as human almost. How long will it take to sequence the DNA of him. So we plan to do the DNA extraction and the library, we call it library prep, that makes the DNA ready for sequencing. We're going to take just under a day and then sequencing is going to take a day and a half. Okay, so we're going to take a couple of hair samples now. I know you really... Okay. Okay, so I'm trying to get the dog to not wiggle because I don't want to cut him while he's moving. But I'm going to take some hair just from the back of his neck. Can you, can you hold on to your dog for a minute? Just. <laughs> yeah, that should be plenty of hair here. <laughs> that should be more than enough dog in this tube. Thank you so much, Bruce. Bruce, Bruce, Biscuit. And we'll find out the results at the end of the episode, so stay tuned to figure out how much wolf is still in little Bruce. Where do dogs come from? By looking at their DNA, scientists can tell that they're most closely related to wolves. Back in the old hunter-gatherer days, we humans domesticated some wild wolves. We bred them into dogs. And we bred them well. 
Back in those days, if you didn't have good guard dogs, your sheep got eaten and you starved. Normally, evolving this much takes millions of years, but in this case, there were only tens of thousands. Evolution had to get creative, and so the genetics of dogs got really weird. I spoke to James Serpel, a professor of animal ethics and welfare at the University of Pennsylvania. He started telling me about some more recent history, where that weirdness got dialed up to 11. In the 1850s, Victorians started to focus on dogs as a kind of a hobby breeding species. You've got the creation of something called the dog fancy. Prior to the 1850s, there were lots of different breeds or more correctly land races of dogs out there. People took these local varieties and then, as it were, genetically isolated them from the rest of the dog population and started breeding like to like. They created stud books so that they knew exactly who had been bred to whom. That in itself creates problems because you've got such a limited pool of genes to draw upon in the first place and you also get things like um, inbreeding depression occurring and founder effects and genetic drift and so on. Can you explain what you mean by this inbreeding depression and founder effects and all these things? Well, founder effects is essentially just the result of starting with a very small initial population. So instead of having a wide diversity of genes contributing to your population, you're selecting for a very small number to begin with. Genetic drift is when just through random processes, a dog dying or a dog disappearing from the population, because you've got such a small initial founding population, that tends to make that genetic pool, if you like, drift in peculiar directions. Inbreeding, the sort of things that happen then are if you've got a deleterious gene in the population, usually that will be masked by more dominant genes that are healthy. But if you start doing a lot of inbreeding, you can mess that up and what you get is the expression of these deleterious genes. And those deleterious genes could be something that reduces fertility, that increases predisposition to cancer, all, all kinds of possible things can go on. Yes, it was sort of bad news for the genetics of the animals. And people actually recognized the dangers very early on, even before anybody knew anything about genetics. Has that led to consequences for dogs today? Yes. So for many breeds, they're quite inbred. The other effect has been that they wrote down what they called the breed standard, which was a verbal description of the breed. And sometimes these breed standards are kind of absurd when you, you look at them in practical terms. So in the English bulldog, for example, the standard says the distance between the tip of the nose and the forehead, essentially, should be as short as possible. So obviously, if you're a bulldog breeder or a bulldog judge at a dog show, what you're looking for is an animal that has a very short distance between the nose and the forehead or no distance at all. And in fact, that's sort of what has happened to the bulldog's head. The nose has been pushed backwards until it is in fact flush with the front of the dog's head. And as a result, most bulldogs have difficulty breathing and many will require surgery to correct this problem. Now, I'm sure it was never <laughs> in anybody's design to produce an animal that can't breed, but if the breed standard said there should be minimal distance between the tip of the nose and the forehead, then that's what the breeders and the judges were aiming for. And they've succeeded horribly. And this is not just in reference to the dog's head. It's a problem now with the fact that many of these brachycephalic breeds, like the bulldog, the ones with the squashed faces, can't actually uh, breed properly. The puppies have to be born by cesarean section. And this is also a product of breeding for a very large head size in relation to hip size. It's unsafe now for uh, the female dogs to give birth naturally. Clearly, when you get to that sort of point, something has gone horribly wrong with the process. So why is it that the breeding standard has said that they should have such short faces and, and that we've bred them like this? The research that's been done so far suggests that people find this look very, very appealing. To some people, these dogs look kind of infantile, look like human infants, and they find them irresistibly cute, irresistibly appealing. In the last 10 years, a lot of these breeds have shown a massive increase in popularity across Europe and the United States. Things like French bulldogs, pugs, English bulldogs, they've become super popular breeds. 
Are these dogs suffering? Absolutely, without a doubt. And they may suffer for their entire life. The problem with these dogs is they can't breathe. You know, they, if you try and exercise them too much, they will collapse. They have severe respiratory problems. They have all kinds of skin fold problems. Their eyes bulge out and tend to get injured because, you know, they'll crash into a branch or an object on the ground and scratch the cornea of the eye. Many of these dogs will have to have surgery to correct the breathing problems. They're going to develop other health problems during their lifetimes that's going to cost their owners money and a lot of grief. They're probably going to die young. Normally, if something we're doing to animals is causing this level of suffering, we would um, have laws and rules that would restrict that type of behavior. But because these are pets and they live as members of our families somehow, we don't think of them in quite the same way. But I think a lot of it is just uh, ignorance and public blindness to the problems that have been created. They don't really see it for what it is. Can I ask, do you own a dog? I do, yes. What kind of dog? He's a sort of average, mutt-looking, shaggy-haired, black dog, medium-sized, very nice temperament. We call him a Bosnian snake hound. <laughs> wow. This is, a, this is a joke. He did once meet a snake and he chased it into a hole. And that was probably <laughs> the most exciting thing he's ever encountered. It's fair to say that the dog genome has been under a lot of pressure. Thanks to the breeding of the last 150 years, the variation within a single breed of dogs is really small. Which means that if you know what you're doing, dog genes aren't as complicated a puzzle to solve as they might be. Jeff Schoenbeck is one person trying to solve that puzzle, specifically trying to find the genes that code for flat faces brachycephaly. His lab at the Roslyn Institute in Edinburgh gets data from CT scans of dogs from a nearby animal hospital. We take that data, we generate 3D reconstructions, and so it gives us a very quantitative description of the dog's overall size, the length of its face, the roundness of its uh, brain case. When there's leftover bloods, we call them residuals, when we have owner consent, we're able to use these blood samples to extract DNA. So if we have the metrics and then we have the DNA of, the, of a dog, then we can begin building this population data set. And so we want to understand what are the genetics of reducing face length, and then we want to know, are there certain changes that are more responsible for this airway condition that, that afflicts these dogs? If there are, they're tricky to find. Because each breed is so related to each other, any gene they all share might code for anything from shorter faces to stumpier legs or curlier tails. And so the challenge is to separate out all those factors. And you can't do that if you just have data from purebred bulldogs, for example. We're collecting data from dogs that are mixed breed as well, or dogs that are maybe have a slightly shorter face, but not nearly as dramatic as our bulldog. And so by utilizing that mixed genetic ancestry, we can help pinpoint the genetic changes that we believe are relevant to morphology and that aren't necessarily related to some other commonality. So if the mixed breeds with shorter faces all share a certain gene with the pugs, then you might be onto something. It's just a matter of finding that gene. At its heart, what we're trying to do is we're looking across each dog's genome at markers. And these markers are just simple genetic differences. Specifically, a genetic marker is a certain point on a certain chromosome that you can use to compare the dogs. And the point is by using a bunch of those, you can narrow in on the right place to start looking in more detail. How does that work? Well, let's say you pick a single point as your marker halfway down chromosome number one. The molecule at that point could be any of the four building blocks of DNA, A, C, G, or T. Let's say one dog has an A at that point and another has a C. Well, that's all fine. And maybe a short-faced dog is equally likely to have an A there as a long-faced one. But what if way more of the short-faced dogs actually have a C there. That's a hint. Maybe that part of chromosome 1 is important for short faces. You'd say that the marker is segregating according to face length. And you know what? That's exactly what Jeff and his team found. 
it was not just one marker, it was a bunch of markers within the same region. And as geneticists, we like that, you know. And indeed, so the one difference that we discovered on chromosome one is that there's this bit of DNA that, that jumped in to the middle of a gene. Now, it didn't jump into the portion of the gene that encodes a protein, but nonetheless, it jumped into, into the middle of the gene and caused the gene to malfunction, if you will. The gene product wasn't made correctly. And this gene is known to have a role in skeletal development, and it's a very good candidate for being the major contributor to reducing face length. The gene is called SMOC2, S-M-O-C-2. Jeff's team are sure it's a major player. Pugs, bulldogs, and French bulldogs all have two copies of it. But to date, there are at least two other genes that have also been found to affect a dog's face length. So it turns out it's not actually that simple. SMOC2 isn't exactly the face length gene. We describe face length reduction in dogs as being a complex genetic trait, meaning it's not just one gene, rather it's a bunch of genes working together and depending on what kind of flavor of that gene an individual has will determine you know, where along a continuum of face length it will um, reside. And then face length is only part of the picture. Jeff and his team are also specifically looking into the breathing problem, brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome. And they started looking in a breed you wouldn't expect, Norwich Terriers. They're not flat-faced in the way that you think of a, of a bulldog or a pug. But yet, a certain portion of these dogs were suffering from a condition labeled upper airway syndrome. So how could this be? And, you know, the question is, how could we reconcile this? Is, is this a condition that is simply specific to Norwich Terriers and it just kind of masquerades in a way that, that resembles what's occurring in, in bulldogs and these other breeds? Or is it that it's brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome really, you know, maybe it's not all about face shape. They think they've found a mutation that causes this quote-unquote upper airway syndrome, and it's a problem with a gene called ADAMTS3. ADAMTS3 seems to affect the fluid in your airways. And get this, both bulldogs and French bulldogs have the same broken version of ADAMTS3. And as far as we know, it doesn't have anything to do with skull shape. So that observation suggests there's the possibility that there are some things that can be selected against that may help improve their breathing without necessarily changing their skull uh, shape. But if it might be possible to breed out this Adam TS3 variation, could you just do the same for the other genes that the team have found? Like that one SMOC2? Oh, they, they can breed out the SMOC2 gene in bulldogs because as far as we know, every bulldog has two copies of the genetic insertion that, that we discovered. So there's no other bulldog that doesn't carry it, at least as far as we know. Even if there was, it would be such a small segment of the overall population of bulldogs that to breed just that one group of, of dogs would be disastrous. It would, it would cause you know almost a collapse in genetic diversity. In a breed who's arguably already at risk of being too homogeneous on a genetic level. Probably the best way to go about reducing the effects of these, these problematic flavors of genes is to, is to outcross, to bring in another dog that isn't specifically a bulldog, that doesn't have the very, very short face to breed away from the extreme short face that exists currently. It's a viewpoint that I acknowledge is highly controversial, but you know, that is one way. So there isn't gonna be one silver magic, you know, magic silver bullet for all these dogs. After the break, some possible solutions, and our black lab comes back from the lab. Music in the program is sponsored by Epidemic Sound, perfect music for audio and video productions. Hi Katie, how are you? I'm pretty snug to be honest. <laughs> Quite cosy in here. The Naked Neuroscience podcast explores the workings of the brain and the nervous system in our bodies and beyond. It does not mean that you need to be sophisticated on an instrument, you can just hack on the piano. 
podcast so I can legitimately tell my friends to shut up because <laughs> I've just passed my driving test. You have my blessing, yeah. Do you want to know who you are? Can we actually understand how we think? From lifting the lid on consciousness to remembering how to forget, join me, Katie Haler, each month as we make connections with scientists and spark up conversations on the latest neuroscience news. Listen and download for free at nakedscientists.com forward slash neuroscience or subscribe to Naked Neuroscience wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Naked Genetics. I'm Phil Sansom. We're talking dogs, dog genes, flat faces, and genetic problems. Someone who's neck deep in this stuff is Jemima Harrison. She's a journalist and a campaigner who founded an organization called CRUFA, the Campaign for Responsible Use of Flat-Faced Animals. And I run a rescue rehoming gun dog types. <laughs> <laughs> Although the Kennel Club is doing a whole heap more than it used to, the shape of these dogs is still codified in the Kennel Club breed standard, which demands flat faces, round big eyes. It self-perpetuates, really, because the breed standard demands that the dogs look like this, despite very small tweaks in those breed standards. So now, rather than saying very short, it might say fairly short. But all these phrases are pretty meaningless when you're dealing with a culture of breeders that have always done it a particular way. Anything that has been crossed to another breed to bring in health or more moderate features is seen as a mongrel. That perception needs to be addressed. What is it that makes you personally so passionate about this? Oh, well, I've always been completely dog mad. But in 2001, my dog died my dog Freddie, and Freddie was a flat-coated retriever, a breed that is really compromised genetically because it's a small breed and has been extremely inbred. There isn't any individual that is less inbred than a full sibling, sorry, half sibling, I should say, to any other flat coat. And it was after he died that I discovered that the breed was completely beset by cancer and a particular type of soft tissue sarcoma 50% of flat coats will be dead by the age of eight stroke nine from some form of cancer. And it was inevitably, I mean, it didn't really take anybody with any nous to be able to suss out that it was because of inbreeding and because of a feature called popular sires, where if a male dog wins big in the show ring, everybody wants to have its babies. So of course that causes havoc genetically because you are reducing the gene pool with every generation. It just horrified me that people were just accepting it. I had a breeder turn around to me and say, oh, you have to love them a lot because you don't have them for long. And I felt like strangling her because I just felt it doesn't have to be like that. We're really smart. I mean, what breeders do is incredible. It's just that if they were able to turn around how they saw things, that would be something incredible. And so I'm hoping that in my lifetime, I will see some real change. That would make me incredibly happy. I mean, I, I am, someone once said to me, a flatmate years ago in London, I said to a flat girl, well, of course, I've always been half dog. And they said to me, hmm, I don't think there's that much human in you. What's your ideal world then, out of all of this? Oh, goodness. <laughs> a world where we appreciated that the dog is a dog and not a baby, that it deserves functional eyes, a respiratory system that works, a body that can mate and give birth naturally. I want dogs to be dogs. If you had a pug or an English bulldog or a French bulldog breeder in front of you or an owner, what would you tell them? We've got to do better by these dogs. The dogs love us absolutely, unequivocally, unjudgmentally, and we are doing them such a disservice in return. So I would beg anybody who's got a brachycephalic dog now to love them to bits, but never get another one.
Jemima Harrison there from Cruffer. Now, machines have been worrying, computers have been computing, as we've sequenced the genes of Bruce the Black Lab puppy. Now his results are in. We sent Amelia and Bruce back to meet Illumina scientists Julian Gehring and Ursula Arndt. What secrets do his DNA hold? Bruce's genome is like a massive book, so like several copies of a Harry Potter series in a way. But what you get out of the sequencer are like very short fragments of the text, so like individual words or fragments of a sentence. Now, in order to analyze that, what we try to do is like put the text together in a way. So you basically put the book back together with all the sentences and chapters in the right place. Exactly, that's what we do. And the way we do is that we have like a template of how an average dog genome could look like. And with this as a template, we can take these individual pieces, these individual fragments, and put them all together in place. We can then look for what we call variation or alterations in the genome, which will then tell us how Bruce's genome is different from that of an average dog. What did this actually show you? What did you find? What we found was that your puppy looks like a Labrador and genetically looks a lot like a Labrador as well. So what's the likelihood of Bruce being descended from a wolf? He's much closer to a wolf than he is, for example, to a cat or a human. That's what we could see in the data. And by looking at different dog breeds, you, we could see, for example, that huskies are still rather similar to wolves. Then afterwards come a bit Labradors, which are in the middle, and then uh, very distinct from wolves are then dog breeds like pugs or chihuahuas uh, or terriers. So what other things did you find in Bruce's saliva? That's a really good question. So we were really interested in that. Most of the DNA was dark, but there was a little bit of bacteria in there as well. Most of the bacteria are just normal, and we found a little bit of plant potentially, which makes sense because he's been chewing on stuff while we were sampling, right? We didn't find as much bacteria that we had kind of anticipated. Bruce is only 12 weeks old, so I think his microbiome might still be developing until he's an adult, just like with human children. I think if you look at the data set of Bruce now and the understanding of his genome, it's probably the best sequence dog we have at the moment. So there's probably more interesting stuff to find in his genome. The next thing we have to do is like find the cuteness gene and figure out why he looks so cute and cuddly. Thank you very much for doing what you've done with Bruce's DNA. And thanks from me too. Finally today, Julian, interesting that you mention a gene for cuteness. We sent roving reporter Lucy Cole to investigate just that. There isn't a cuteness gene. But here is the next best thing. Have you ever thought that your dog is able to make the most adorable puppy eyes at exactly the right moment? Well, British and American researchers have found that dogs have in fact evolved a particular muscle in their face to allow them to do just this. It's just above the eyebrow and it's called the levator anguli oculi medialis. It allows dogs to lift the inner corners of their eyebrows to create those unmistakable puppy dog eyes. In this study, researchers dissected both dogs and wolves to compare them. It turns out that wolves don't have this extra muscle, so it seems that dogs have developed it since being domesticated around 33,000 years ago. In fact, the team found that the Siberian Husky, which is an ancient breed of dog more closely related to the wolf, is the only species which doesn't have it. This means that it's taken just a few tens of thousands of years for this to evolve, which in evolutionary terms is extremely quick. We don't yet know what genes are behind the levator anguli oculi medialis, but muscles are complex structures and evolving a new one would probably need some big genetic changes. Why would this have happened? That's what the next part of the study was investigating. The researchers tested how live dogs and wolves reacted when a stranger approached them. Dogs raised their eyebrows more commonly than wolves and in a far more exaggerated way. The theory is that using this muscle to raise their eyebrow actually helps dogs form social connections with us and makes us want to care for them. Raising their eyebrows makes their eyes bigger and more like human children's eyes, which elicits a caring response in us. Perhaps 33,000 years ago, our ancestors were more likely to bring a dog in from the cold and protect it if it could lift its eyebrows to look more like a human baby. In fact, in a previous study, the same researchers found that dogs who raise their eyebrows get adopted from rehoming centres more quickly. So if being adopted gives a dog's genes a better chance of survival, 
it seems that even today, dogs with more puppy-like features could have a selective advantage. So next time you find yourself looking into those puppy dog eyes and forgiving your dog for misbehaving, just remember that it's entirely our fault. That's it for the Naked Scientist Dog Show. While the judges calculate our scores, I'd like to thank Jemima Harrison, James Serpel, Jeff Schoenbeck, Ursula Arndt, Julian Gehring, Madeline Geiger, Elaine Ostrander, and Jessica Perry Heckman. Chris and Amelia Smith reported on Will It Sequence, and Lucy Cole brought us the story about puppy dog eyes. Special thanks to Bruce, who is a very good boy. Naked Genetics is on Twitter at Naked Genetics, or send your emails to phil at nakedscientist.com. I'm Phil Stanson. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.